Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I have with me Kirk Winter, who also runs the YouTube channel 46 Degrees North. He's adopted already, taking his family and living in an off-grid lifestyle. Now, I wanted to talk to Kirk today for a couple of reasons. First, to share some information about when you taper off this grid lifestyle in the city living or the suburb. So when you take on this off-grid lifestyle, what are some of the the things that you're going to encounter that might be troublesome or setbacks that will give you frustration? I wanted to talk a little bit about that first. And secondly, if you haven't noticed the weather, in Quebec, Canada right now, it's snowing. In the eastern maritimes of Canada, it's been all-time record cold for the start in the spring of this year, as well as remaining at record low temperatures, broken again and again and again, all through June and July. And now, record cold in Greenland, so I wanted to bring somebody on who's up in the area that can verify what's happening. So, Kirk, welcome, and uh, yeah, you're doing it. You're doing something that a lot of not of people are doing, but they're going to have to be more self-sufficient have their own power, have their own source of food, and get ready mentally for this. So the show's yours. I'll let you say what you want to say, and thank you so much for your time today joining me. Hey, no problem at all, David. Thanks for having me on. Well, i got to say, uh, one of the first things I've noticed this summer is it is just not warm at all. Presently, we're sitting at about 16 degrees Celsius. I'm sitting on my couch with a sweater on. Yesterday was just a normal summer day. Well, not yesterday. The day before, I guess, was a normal summer day. It was quite warm. For the most part, it is just really abnormal weather up here. They've usually done a spring hay cut by now. The first cut of hay has usually come out by now, and there's just there's nothing to cut up here. Anyway, you go southern Ontario, and I think they've done a, a spring hay cut already, but uh, up here, uh, it looks like they're only going to get a one hay cut this year. And uh, last year was already, we know, one farm uh, that we deal with quite a bit. It's a, an organic potato farm, the Ellenberger's or Organic Potato Farm. And they they couldn't get their crop in the ground this year at all uh, until, like, really, really late because there's just so much rain. Cloud cover and rain has been just incessant. Uh, i got to say, it's it's not just affecting crops. It's affecting everything. It's affecting uh, my industry. I'm a crane operator by trade, and there's just absolutely no work. The cooler temps are affecting the, the trade. I, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out what is going on, but I actually had to, to leave my job and head back to the large city of Toronto to get employment to build our house because, as you can see by my channel, where we're kind of living in a, a temporary situation right now as we construct a new home. It's going to be fitting temperatures and is also going to incorporate a lot of those rotary food production systems that I've seen on your channel very many times. And uh, we're going to do the best we can with what we've got to work with up here. Uh, we already know that uh, solar energy is not going to work in the solar minimum. It's going to be pretty much winter all year round, basically. And I'll tell you what, in the winter, it is really difficult to keep the lights on around here when we're running Internet and stuff. Internet is a real power-hungry thing uh, when you're off the grid. And the one thing uh, that we won't have to power, obviously, in the wintertime is the Internet. So I don't know. If we're going to be growing anything in the basement, we're going to have to be putting out at least a couple thousand watts. One of the first big modifications that we need to make the outside walls a lot larger than they were by design. Now, by design, our house will incorporate the outside of the house or the, the brick or whatever we're going to do. It's going to be two inches of insulation one half inch of plywood and the two by eight outside walls with two by eight wall stud insulation and then to complete that with vapor barrier and of course drywall. Uh, that's been upgraded from one inch of foam on the outside and a two by six outside wall. So we've really bumped the R value on the outside of the outside walls of the house and uh, the truss area is also going to be really beefed up. That's our goal here. But getting back to the employment thing, you know, I'm, I'm building this house paycheck to paycheck. You know, we're refusing to get a loan from the bank just so we can stay in, in what I look at as a very safe rural environment that we can establish uh, a homestead that's uh, prepared for these coming cold temperatures. Um, having said that, I'm starting to get nervous at the timeline. I didn't want to really start seeing weather changes like this quite yet. I was hoping it would move a little slower. 
So all in all, did, uh, we're just plugging away here, trying to learn at this solar minimum and, and tell other folks that they need to really start getting prepped up and ready for it because what is happening, why not just go the complete opposite direction? You know, the, the world's going to cool. We also know it's going to warm up a little bit more before it starts to cool. It's how much do they know and how far are they willing to let this go before they say, okay, this is what's happening, guys. Well, I'll start answering that last question for you there first. If they told the world what was to happen, I think there would be so much retribution against the scientists and against the IPCC and against the whole Al Gore crew that that would be a society upsetting event in itself. But B, that would induce panic instantly. Absolute instant panic. The economy would collapse from all the people pulling their money out of their stock accounts and IRAs and retirement funds and whatever else, bank accounts, to get ready for this grand solar minimum. The economy would collapse literally within less than a month because everybody would pull their money out and we're working on fractional reserving and that sort of thing. But I wanted to ask about the hay cut you were talking about. How is this affecting prices of other, shall we say, down the supply chain, whatever it be, food for uh, maybe cows or hay for whatever it's used in any manner. I mean, what, what's the the trickle down effect is affecting prices? How because they're not getting this hay cut in. That's at the very basic. First of all, uh, what is happening with food is it's going right through the roof, David. Right through the roof. My my wife does the grocery shopping, and last night uh, we we kind of treated ourselves to a steak. We don't get steaks very often around here. All our money gets put into our house and things that our house is going to need. But the night before, we had a steak, and there were two small tenderloin steaks about the size of the top of a cup of coffee and uh, about an inch and a half thick, and we paid $30 for two steaks. A head of cauliflower is $5. Everything is going up in price. Everything. That's outrageous. You understand that we are just at the very beginning of the food price rises. At the end of the year, when the crops come in, they're going to be so far under the yield that was forecast that it's going to shock the markets how low the harvest size is in millions of tons of wheat globally. It is going to send a tsunami, shockwave through, and everybody's going to wake up at that point and go, "Uh uh-oh, and just forget if they understand about the grand solar minimum. Just the amount of crop losses this year, we're looking at like 50 million tons down globally on the wheat. That is going to drive the prices up 12, 15, 18% at the minimum just on the base commodity. That's going to ripple through everything else as well. And that is only wheat. That is not oats. That is not barley. It's just wheat. And barley went up and lean hogs and cattle and all these things I'm talking about have been up, up, up. And when the harvest come in, they're going to go up even higher. And in a rapid pace, too. So what you're seeing, Kirk, is going to be amazing food price rises on your end at the end of the year. They're already here. A lot of them are coming. They're getting worse. I do know the farm that we deal with, uh, we get a lot of our food from. uh, They're organic potatoes, a lot of organic vegetables, organic beef. They had to put down a few animals last year because there wasn't enough hay for the animals. Uh, The farmers even go into other fields that aren't being used at all. They're just kind of growing wild hay there. And uh, he's actually going from land to land, just trying to get enough grass and hay to feed his animals for the winter. But it, even doing that last year wasn't enough, and he had to put some animals down. Uh, David, I will say, and this I'm going to make a video on this later. you got to check my channel out. The leaves are starting to fall off the trees July 23rd. Cherry trees are starting to shed their leaves. That is unbelievable. Remember, 46 degrees north on YouTube. That is the channel he's referencing here. Also, if you're interested in the off-grid lifestyle, there's several videos there for anybody who's getting ready to go into this. We're all going to need to grow food. That's at the very basic minimum. If you take anything away from this conversation we're having, you're going to need to be more self-sufficient. You're going to have to grow your own food. But what you're talking about, Kirk, is with all this rain, they can't even get potatoes in the ground. What other farmers have been delayed due to planting? Is there like corn delays or what other kind of delays are there for which crops that you've heard of locally within, say, a couple hundred miles from where you live? The warmest growing zone we have near us, southern Ontario, Belleville, Peach Zone, Niagara, uh, corn's only knee-high. 
only knee high. And it's funny, I heard you reference that in one of your videos, and it's not doing very well at all. Even our potatoes. We got potatoes in our garden this year. And we're just kind of let them go wild this year because we're so busy with the house and work and whatnot. Our potatoes, are, the year before last, they were so big and bushy. Uh, this year, they're just little tiny plants. Uh, I don't expect much from them. Uh, nothing's growing, man. The produce all looks like crap. Onions look like, and it's just looking like crap. I'd say they're growing in Canada, but they're not growing outside, I'll tell you that. There's no way. And you're talking about the power requirements to bring everything indoor, whether it be vertical farming, microgreen farming with LED lights, whatever. That's going to take an enormous drive on power. The electrical prices are going to go up as well. So we're going to get into this double whammy now of double price increases. A lot of people, David, think that it's very difficult to do what we're doing. And let me tell you something. When you're managing everything yourself, your own power, your own water, you're doing it all by yourself, you, you got to have some prior knowledge. So I, I suggest everybody get digging in millions of YouTube channels out there by now that are showing folks. I learned everything I know about solar and power and alternative energy from YouTube and reading different things here and there, but basically just from YouTube. I'm a watch how you do it and go do it myself type of guy. Let me tell you something. Doing what we're doing here isn't that difficult. We bought three acres of land for $10,000 plus expenses, so that came out to about fifteen grand. Our well was six. Uh, you know, we've been working at this for three years now. If anybody's out there and they're on the edge of their couch about whether they want to stay in the city and, and stay in the slave trade and, and just wait until it's too cold and things start falling apart, and I don't know what your plan is there. You're going to maybe head north or head south, but I'm telling you what, man, when this stuff finally does crescendo, they're not going to allow people moving around. I'm telling you, they're not. I just always had that gut feeling. If you're going to do it, you need to get started. At least go out and start looking for land. Lots of people on my channel are already looking for land. We try to counsel some of our subscribers that are looking in the area. You've got to get out and do it. There's not much time to waste. If any, I wouldn't waste any time after this. Even now, getting our house built, I am starting to feel a time zone panic, man. It is time to really get building here. And if we do want to put a timeline onto this, 2019, will, that will be the event of the century that wakes everybody up. In 2019, the crop losses are going to be so gargantuan and so vast and so all-encompassing. And the cold is going to rip across the planet in unexpected ways like it is in South America now. I mean, they had those storms rip all the way across the continent setting records of cold and records of homes without power and the highest winds and coldest temperatures and the deepest snowfalls. You know, whatever was left in the, all the fruit orchards are decimated down in South America and the harvest that were still out and they were harvesting in the field. They were trying to get, you know, wheat and corn still in and the last, you know, it was all whatever's left is stranded in the fields. That's not coming out. And Australia is 40% down this year as well on the wheat harvest. We compared to last year, they're going to be 40% down from last year's number. And I know last year was an, a record by, what, like 2 million tons, but they're down 15 million tons this year. That is enormous. And America lost 40% of its wheat, and it is going to be such a lightning fast event. When you say do not waste time, I can't reiterate that. I'm moving back from where I am. I'm giving up my entire life out here to move back. I do not want to be stuck in Asia when this goes down. This is an incredibly packed place to be with billions of people squeezed into a small space. You need to be around a community that you know, people you trust, and it needs to be a place that's not as densely packed. You know, these big cities in America, Los Angeles, those are not going to be safe places to be at all. And we are out of time, truly out of time. We're, we're done. We're out of time. We are out of time. Definitely, definitely. A lot of people are on the fence whether things are going to happen. They've been barraged with many different conspiracy theories. A lot of these are created to keep you restricted from your ascent up what I call the tree of truth. Easy to get lost on them lower branches. That's the things to contradict things that are really happening. They're just going to throw you off. And that if they haven't heard it on the mainstream news, and it just doesn't exist. You know, they've been programmed that way for tens of years. It's very powerful conditioning bang into you ever since you're young our earth it cycles it cycles and it cycles man and that's just the way it goes these cycles are not unknown 
that we just woke up pretty much 150 years ago and we're just finding our, our place on the earth. Give me a break. People know where we've been here and we know it's cycles. Everybody should get at it right now. I mean, it's easy to find $10,000 if you're even a blue collar stiff like me and we're doing it. And, you know, it really does take two. You've got to work hard together and get her done. Even my daughter's involved. Now, Kirk, talking about the cycles, I do want to go into that. Valentin Zarkova, their brand new research with Shepard, Potpov, Zarkov, and Zarkova, their new report comes out and said that we are going to mimic and go back into the sporer minimum 1450s type of cooling, 1430s, somewhere in that era. So if you're looking for a degree marker temperature-wise that we are going to get down to, we are going to get down into the spore minimum. We have to go back 600 plus years to reach the temperature range. So when you start to see 500 year storms, that's just going to be the norm because we're going back to that cycle again. These range you're seeing now are nothing. Out of your experience so far and what you've learned, David, what could be the coldest temperature that we're going to see uh, roughly at 46 degrees north in the dead of winter? It's not going to really get that much colder than it is right now, maybe 3C colder or 2.5C cooler, but it's going to be the periphery of these seasons. The going in of the winter and coming out of the winter, the fall and the spring are the things that are going to have cooler, wetter conditions, and the cooler conditions can be 3, 4C cooler. And this is the whole thing, and then the planting times get out of season and out of whack. We're seeing that right now. It is It's cold today. And I'm where I'm sitting on my couch wearing a sweater. Usually it's so hot you can't even breathe. Wait till it amplifies and you can't even plant for one whole year. What's going to happen on this planet when they cannot plant for one year in, say, 50% of the major crop producing countries because it's too wet, too cold, or whatnot? What, what do you think is going to happen then at that point? And how will the media cover it? That's more important. You touched on the media, the mainstream media. How are they going to try to cover this? They can't cover it up. They're going to have to cover it in some way. They're trying to push this as long as they possibly can. That is starting to register to me now. Keep the machine running. Done a lot of experimenting and indoor growing over the last three years, and I'm kind of getting educated more and more in it. But, hey, let me just tell you a little bit about well water. Now, some well water, especially up where we're at, is deep in the rock. And so we pull our water out. It has got lots of metal. It's got lots of, you can tell it's very, very heavy water. And it's got lots of minerals in it. It's an overload. They can get an overload in iron. They can get an overload in different minerals. And that affects what's called nutrient uptake into the plant. Whenever a plant starts to get stressed out by too much of something, it simply stops taking everything up. You need to know about that because if all you have around you, like us, is hard water, you have to implement things in, into your design. It's going to purify that water a little bit so it's easier for the plants to uptake. I wanted to point that out, too, because I foresaw that problem coming because right now we're going something inside and it's not doing well on well water but does great with distilled water. Yeah, and I'll say the same thing. I'm trying to put together, well, I have put together, a aeroponic system where I use a misting machine and uh, it sends the mist down pipes to aerate the roots and take up minerals like you're talking about. But what I keep finding is because of the mist, it's getting iron rust on everything all the time. So, you know, I'm already learning this. This is not a good thing. You know, I mean, if it came down to we were going to die if that food didn't grow, we would have died by now. Seriously. These are things you need to get in hand. Absolutely. That iron is going to plug up the little jets on your mister. I know your, your uh, aeroponics design. They did something similar, uh, what I call a bubble cloner when I was cloning pepper plants. Basically, I was just pumping water through piping uh, to little wee jets that I got at the hydroponics store. And what that did is threw a mist into a chamber where the roots were all hanging. And so I've done a little aeroponic growing myself. And I, I, I totally agree to do it with the water that I have available up here for very long. What's going to happen is a complete clog. Uh, some jets aren't going to squirt right. It's not going to be a nice, fine, atomized mist anymore. It's going to be more of a liquid squirting out of one hole. So... These things got to be forethought about, David. You got to think about these things in advance because once there's two meters of snow on the friggin' road and they don't clear the roads anymore, how are you going to eat? Yeah, and it comes down to physical fitness. Now, when you even try to walk in deep snow like that, even if it's knee deep, 
it is incredibly taxing the amount of energy that you need. But if it was waist deep or what you're talking about, multiple meters, there's no way to get through that. Snowshoes. But who's ready to walk in snowshoes five miles or like eight, nine kilometers down somewhere, grab something in a backpack and then make it back another nine kilometers back through the snow? Very few people can do that. You need animals. Yeah, David, let me just throw something in there. I have a series on my channel called Emergency Evacuation Series. You got to check that out. That is going out in the dead of winter without snowshoes and what we did experience in those. It's a three video series. I haven't done the third video because I got to stay outside in minus 40. But uh, we did do the first two videos and you got to check out how difficult of a time we had walking in the snow. And we were only going three kilometers from our house. So, I mean, anybody trying to do a major exodus out of the city, good luck. And not only that, but you'll have the banditry and the, these types of unsavory characters who have come together to prey on those that are leaving. And, you know, whether you like firearms or you disagree with firearms, and I know there's a lot of division across societies on this planet on this, even if you take a machete with you or some kind of long blade, I mean, you're going to have to defend yourself when you're going to be trying to move. Yeah, where are you going? You know, even if you do get out of the city, where are you going? You're going to go up north and hunt? Yeah, the animals are all dying, too, because they haven't eaten. I mean, what are you going to do? And you know, we'll be hunted out. If you want to talk about the 1930s, all the stories in the 30s, the American Great Depression, the entire woods was hunted out to absolute nothing left. And that was the time when people grew their own food. Everybody was self-sufficient. I mean, much more than today. But the entire ecosystem was hunted out down to birds and squirrels. They were gone, too. Not to mention your carniv carnivorous animals in the, in the woods, you know, for instance, your scavenger bears, black bears, stuff like that. They're going to get really hungry and they're going to change their diet and they're going to come looking for food. So you got to be ready for everything. And you can't wait till the last minute. You can't wait until a complete confirmation. You have to have a little bit of trust in the people that are working around it. Dig deep, do your own research for sure. And, uh, don't just go to one person for information. You need to go around and confirm this. That's what I love about your channel is you've got links to everywhere you've discovered this information. And, uh, you know, people are smart. People can put two to two together. But you need to be where you're going before things start falling apart. That's for darn sure. Yeah, and that comes back to what's your backup plan to your backup plan to that backup plan? Because, you know, when you start to think about these evac situations or bugging out or bugging in or doing something lifestyle-wise, you know, those things don't always go the way in we envision it and play that movie in our head of this is going to happen and then I'm going to do this. And that's going to happen and I'm going to react this way. But what if it doesn't happen the way you think it is in your head and then you need to react in version C, D, or E that you didn't plan for yet? I mean, do you have a backup to the backup? That's an honest question. For one set of scenario that you prepare for so much, what happens if you can't get back to your supplies because something happened? I don't know. There's a million things that can go on during these times. And when you look back and read history books about what happened in the modern minimum and what happened in the spore minimum and what happened in the wolf minimum, and we just go back in blocks of history, 1300s, and let's look at that history and what were in the text there. The modern minimum was the scariest. They had human traps. They trapped people for food. That was the scariest. That's why they traveled in bands of people. Anybody went out alone could get caught in a human trap. Hey, what if? You know, they only have so much recorded information in history. Well, at least that's what we have access to. So you're going back and you're looking at these wolf minimum, your modern minimum. You're looking at all these different minimums. But what if the cycle's bigger than that, David? And we've got no documentation to prove this. But what if this is different? You know, we, I've seen in the last three minimums, it's take step downs. How do we know it's going to step back up again? What if it's going to take another step down, even deeper than the modern minimum? Just a question. Yeah, I'll agree. I want to go into something that may be, be a little off topic here that I've talked about in a few of my videos. Okay, we've been exploring, and in specifically the last 300 years of time, the powers that went off and they imperialized and pillaged entire nations after century after century after century and they took those texts and codex and all that information from all those societies who were much more in tune with the galactic cycles they were using hallucinogens to touch in to get greater messages 
the navies in the church and all these people that went out exploring brought all that information back into a repository. You are not allowed down into the Vatican Library. Why not? You are not allowed into so many of the museums even to view the documents, even with somebody standing next to you. Why not? What are they hiding from all this history? You know, you say there's a certain amount of history. I bet we're drip fed like less than 2% of the actual documents that remain of the entire historical cycles going back hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. It's all been written, cataloged. Yeah, I do believe that. that. Our true human history is so rich. Wouldn't it be nice to just know? And a funny thing, here's one that'll get you, and I've mentioned it before in my channel. It's really odd that human history is so long and, and this and that, that they've just discovered Canada a hundred or made Canada country 150 years ago. You tell me they never knew this continent was here a long time ago. I believe they did. Yeah, I believe yeah. that this country is it's not habitable. And they know that this country is only habitable for maybe 100 or 200 years, and that's it. Temperatures drop again, and it's just not a decent place to live anymore. Because the Asian version of history, you know, even if you just talk about the voyages of Zhenghe, which is one of the Chinese explorers, he was sent out in the 1400s because the Chinese, with their records going back a few thousand years of climate, thought another grand solar minimum was starting right then. So they sent him out to set all these new trade routes up. Why do you think the Mongols invaded? Why did the Mongols? Yeah, you can say they were power hungry and everything, but suddenly their conquests for land all started during a grand solar minimum. And every Chinese dynasty has collapsed during a grand solar minimum. The Chinese are very aware, and so are the Asians, specifically Japanese and, and Chinese, about what's going on, especially India, these longer cultures that have 5,000 years of history. You know, they know these cycles that are occurring, and they know what happens to the rulership. They know what happens to the food production. They know what happens with the cycle, and there's cycles within cycles. And I will absolutely agree. I do believe this is a culmination of a lot of smaller mini cycles that are going to build onto a larger cycle. Absolutely. We're at the edge of a cusp of something so great here, they do not want to share it with the public. Absolutely. And it is something very, very big, something we've never seen before. Even if we're lucky enough to go into uh, the minimum of the case he believes that we're going to be going into, even if it's just like that, it's catastrophic enough. But, I mean, they're not going to make all these plans and, and all this deviant information, keep it all from us, if it was something that, and I'm not saying insignificant, but something that's, probably recoverable because if it was then why would they go to these great lengths to keep something like that from the public why not just admit the global cooling and there's something we can all work together to get through and then they can enslave us again i'm sure uh, over a couple of generations and they'd be back to where they are today except the weather's going to be nice for the next little few hundred years if it was like that then why wouldn't they do it like that they're in power already I'm a personal believer that there's already a global authority at work that is unseen. And I think it's something bigger, something much bigger. It's going to get a lot colder than they're letting on. Let me tell you something. In a little town called Port Perry, Ontario, there's a casino called the Blue Heron Casino. Now, right across, and you can Google it and have a look at it and look at the weird structures. Right across the road, from that casino, the Blue Heron Casino in Port Perry, Ontario, I built, as a crane operator last summer, a gas station. And this gas station is designed to operate in subarctic temperatures. It is actually an Arctic design from where they use it in places like Nunavut, Greenland, stuff like that. This is the design for the gas station they use in these climates. It's here in Ontario at approximately 45 degrees north. It's insane. I built it myself. The walls have a foot and a half thick foam. What would they need that for, and why would they overbuild it like that? Not that it's going to be used for a gas station. Who knows? Can I talk about Baffin Island for a second and Nunavut and that whole area up there? When they trace back glaciology, they go back to the seed point of where the glaciers started for that northern hemisphere. The whole Nunavut, Baffin Island area up there is the seed point for the next glaciation. So I always keep my eyes looking toward that spot, and I see it it's snowing up there now in July again. That was my first clue in when I'd seen that from their studies previously where they trace back the full two-mile thick ice or, you know, three kilometers thick ice over the Great Lakes and whatnot. It all began in Baffin Island. 
And that's right next to Nunavut. It's right next to Greenland. So I was thinking, oh, it's got to get colder up there. So all I'm going to do is look for A, more icebergs, B, colder temperatures, C, strange weather, snows in you know the middle of summer like we're seeing now, and it's all starting to come to be. So I, I think we're going into something greater, but they're just not sharing. And they're going to start building buildings much more, I don't know, say, hardy to resist the weather because everything's going to push further south. These bands are going to go way south and cold. We can only do what we can do. Who knows what's going to happen? I do know that they're not going to let millions of people in Canada head into the States and then down into Mexico. I mean, they're, they're putting gates on highway entrances now. I don't know if you're aware of that. I think we talked about this before. All, all of the highway entrances have big gates on them. This is emergency on-ramp closed. They say it's for if it's an accident. They don't have to put a cop car there to stop traffic. I don't know. But, I mean, every single on-ramp on, a, on an interstate in Canada all has on or gates on them now. You're not going to be allowed to. You're not going to be able to get anywhere. There's going to be a point where they're going to pull the plug, uh, and that's going to be it. Who knows what's going to happen? All we can do is prepare the best we can for what we have to work with and hope for the best. And, Kirk, that is a great last point. That's the whole purpose of giving this information out and starting these conversations. You're going to have to do what you can do. And get prepared the best you can get prepared around the area you have with the resources you have. And on that final note, I thank you so much, everyone, for listening, joining us, and spending your valuable time to listen to us discussing the state of agriculture in Canada and truly what's happening that's not being shared in the wider mainstream media. And join me for episode number 31 when I talk with Sam Corey. Guest opinion writer for The Nation in Bangkok, Thailand. He covers Southeast Asia, the agriculture, the politics, and the weather changes. I'll see you then.